Hello and welcome to our half-year results presentation. I'm joined in this virtual meeting by Chris Belsham, Group Finance Director. I'll take you through the operating highlights. Chris will then run through our detailed financial performance, and then I'll come back and highlight our strategy going forward. It's great to report another solid performance from NWF in spite of multiple challenges, COVID-19, Brexit, and a cyber incident. It continues to highlight the real resilience of the group, and we continue to develop in line with our strategy. I'll now move straight to the key results. It's a solid performance in line with expectations. Revenue is down, but that's as a result of a lower oil price. We've actually had increased activity in both our fuels division and also in food. The key number that I always focus on is the headline profit before tax. You can see on the right hand side of 2.5 million. And in point of fact, that's the second highest in the last five years. It's lower than prior year, as we anticipated, because we have some of the startup costs accrue in the first half. Equally important as profit is cash, and you see net debt is at a comfortable level of 16.5 million. That's at 0.9 times headline EBITDA, so the board is comfortable at that level. And in line with our normal policy, we are paying a one pence per share interim dividend. At market expectations are for a an increase in the total dividend for the year and we're comfortable with that at this stage. I've got a slide now which is talking about the impact and response to COVID-19 which obviously we're all continuing to live through. I think the key thing is um, NWF employees we're all key workers we're feeding and fueling the nation and all business activities remain fully operational all the way through the period as they were last March and as they are today and as a group we're not using any government support packages and we've not furloughed any staff. What we have seen is an increase in demand from supermarkets for food from Bowie and lower demand from food service. What we saw last March was an increase in domestic demand for heating oil. Uh, we haven't seen that subsequently. Demand in the first half of fuel has been quite normal and feed demand has been stable. We've got good financial strength as a group. We've got a 65 million pound facility. And as we said, we've only got debt at 0.9 times EBITDA. And we also have a progressive dividend policy. We've continued to pay a dividend through this period and anticipate doing so for the full year. But now we move on to the fuels division. Here we've had very positive trading, uh, traded actually ahead of our expectations as a consequence of higher volumes, improved product mix, and the benefit of the acquisitions. Like for like sales were stable, and you can see our overall volumes up just under 5% as a consequence of those acquisitions. Positively, we sold a better mix of products. So we sold more gas oil, which is also known as res diesel, and less road diesel. And that's a higher margin product, and therefore we've got a gain in our overall business performance. The acquisitions have performed well. They now represent some 18% of our total volume. And in the period, oil prices were reasonably stable, moving between around $38 a barrel to $48 a barrel. But critically, they were 30% lower than the same period in the prior year. So that's why our revenue numbers as a division and also as a group are lower. We continue to invest in acquisition resource, and Chris will talk about this later, but we re-engaged and restarted acquisition activity, supporting the growth of this division. Then moving on to food, here we've had growth, but with volatile demand patterns. What we have done is completed the uh, fill of our new crew warehouse. The picture on the right-hand side, I actually took on my iPhone back at the end of August, so you can see the facility is fully utilized, it's performing as planned, and it's working very efficiently. In total now, we've got 135,000 pallet spaces in our business. You see on average in the first half, we had 121,000 pallets stored, which is a good level of fill. What we did see was a real inefficiency in the first half as a result of significant demand volatility. If I go back to September, we had supermarkets almost panic buying huge demand because they were concerned about future lockdowns. We then had in October, consumers to some extent panic buying because of lockdowns coming. Then in November and into December, we had some additional demand because of concerns about Brexit and the 31st of December. So all of those led to very high levels of demand, which were subsequently followed by very low levels of demand, which led to inefficient activities. 
We've increased activity levels. Our shipments are actually up 19%. And we've also done very well in our e-fulfillment business. This is growing quite rapidly from a profit basis, delivering only a small amount at the moment, but growing significantly and now taking up one of our warehouses on the Wardle site. Then move on to feeds. Here, trading very much as planned. As you know, our focus is on nutrition advice to farmers. And actually, our proportion of sales direct to farm increased in the period. Our overall volumes were down, but that's as a consequence of supplying less to other compounders. What we have been doing is managing dramatic increases in the cost of feed commodities. This is things like soya, rape meal, wheat, and barley, which have gone up dramatically. So a typical diet is now 21% higher in price and cost than it was 12 months ago. So what we've been doing, as the market has, is passing on price increases through to farmers. That's been okay because the milk price in the UK has also gone up. The average milk price is 3p a litre higher than it was a year ago. So the average UK price today is at 30 pence per litre. Also critically, we've continued to invest in the NWF Academy training future nutritionists. So the picture on the right hand side is Adam Clay, our technical manager, uh, delivering a training module on calf nutritional health. Now, this is critical because if you look after the nutrition and health and development of a calf, she'll become a great milking cow. Um, I've actually done this myself. She's trying to measure the girth of a dairy cow or the calf. Um, it's good fun, but it's also very tiring because they do wriggle a bit. But that's what the team's up to there. We've now got 18 people in the academy, and we're also looking to recruit more this summer. Then move on to the cyber instance. So this was something that happened to us um, at the end of October. It was a very short period, so it was only a 48-hour uh, unauthorized access into our systems. And it really came about as a result of home working. Um, and there was a brute force attack into our network, linking into our sort of VPN network, which is our home working operation. So that was unfortunate. The great news is we have cyber insurance and a cyber response policy, which kicked in. So it experts in to help us very quickly. Um, it didn't impact the business performance. We continue to supply all orders to all customers. And what we're highlighting is it didn't have a material impact to our trading or commercial performance. In terms of the outcome, we've now a lot more secure. Chris and I have a couple of very deep scars, but that will help us maintain safety and security going forward. Um, and clearly, we've got additional cybersecurity um, operating across the group. And also positively, the Information Commission has confirmed there'll be no action in respect to the data breach. So I'll now hand over to Chris, who'll take us through the financial highlights. Chris. Thanks, Richard. Good morning, everyone. I'll now take you through the financial highlights, starting with the income statement. Uh, so revenue, as Richard mentioned, has decreased in the period, but that is a result of, of the lower oil price we've experienced at $43 a barrel versus $62 per barrel in the comparative period. And that doesn't have any impact on, on profitability. Headline operating profit and headline profit before tax are both half a million lower. So headline operating profit of three million and headline PBT of two and a half million. And that's because the outperformance in fuels has been offset by the lower performance in food for the reasons that Richard explained. Exceptional items in the period include acquisition related costs. That's in relation to the systems integration and hive up of Dart, which we bought last December, and excesses that will be payable on our cyber insurance. As we announced in November, we don't expect the, the net cost of the cyber incident to be material to the group. So we estimate the cost will be less than half a million. Finance costs in the period are consistent with last year with IFRS 16 interest of 0.2 million. And probably the last thing to bring out on the income statement is that our estimated tax rate for the year is 21%. Clearly that could change if the Chancellor chooses to uh, change the corporation tax rate in the budget in a few weeks time, which might have an impact on our, our deferred tax liability, but we shall see. And lastly, the interim dividend has been maintained at a penny. Moving on to the balance sheet, this continues to be very strong. Total assets up to 194 million or just under, and net assets up to just under 53 million. Our fixed assets have decreased slightly in the period, and that reflects a very prudent approach to CapEx through the COVID pandemic period. 
Uh, I'd expect a little bit of catch up in the second half, but I suspect this year we probably won't get up to our normal level of repair and maintenance spend, which is equal to non IFRS 16 depreciation. I'll come back to net debt and pension on later slides. But the other thing probably just to pull out is networking capital, which has increased, but we would have expected it to, given uh, that we'd acquired Darch and also with the buildup of the crew warehouse. Group return on capital employed continues to be high at 15.6%, but that's reflecting the performance of the fuels business. Clearly in food and feeds, the levels of return are a little bit disappointing and, and we look forward to those coming back as earnings improve in those two divisions. Moving on to the pension, our accounting deficits has reduced to 18.7 million. And you can see in the chart on the right, that's really a result of the increased asset value with our contributions offsetting the change in liability assumptions. We also concluded our triennial valuation to December 2019 in the first half. That resulted in a valuation of 16.8 million versus 19.9 million at the last triennial valuation. As a result, we've agreed with the trustee that the recovery payments will stay at 1.8 million until May 22, and it'll be 2.1 million thereafter. In addition, those recovery payments from January 22 will increase in line with the growth in dividends. So if, if dividends have grown 10% uh, from the period from May 19 to January 22, then that 2.1 million will be 10% higher. Uh, at that level, it's not a constraint on group development given the facilities we have available to us. In terms of the cash flow, probably only a couple of things to pull out here. So firstly, that working capital uh, outflow, very normal for this time of year. We always have a seasonal outflow and we've also seen commodity prices increasing over the period. Um, the other thing just to pull out is the M&A payment and that's in relation to the finalization of the completion accounts on Darch. Uh, that business had a significant amount of surplus working capital in, so an extra payment was required. Um, overall, net debt is still low. If you look at the chart on the right hand side of this slide, our cash flow before development expenditure over the last 12 months has been 5.5 million. Normally, we would guide that we generate about two to three million of cash before development expenditure. So uh, exceeding that, and that really reflects the profits we had in fuels in the back end of the last financial year. We continue to have 65 million of facilities available with NatWest Group, and that's until October 2023. And the significant amount of that is the invoice discounting facility of 50 million. Our average net debt across the period was about 20 million. So we had about up to 40 million of, of facility headroom on average across the period. So plenty of, of financing power there available for group development. Final point on finance is that we had the RCF fully drawn through the period, but have subsequently repaid 7 million of that after the period end, which reduces our interest costs slightly. I'll now hand back to Richard to talk through group development. Okay, thanks, Chris. And start off with the summary and what we have is a very clear development strategy. As you recall, we've got a diversified source of earnings, which reduces risk. We've got cash generative businesses and we operate in large, stable markets. So that gives us security and underpin. But we're also ambitious as a business to develop. And the key focus in terms of that development is consolidating the fuels market. It's a highly fragmented one, and I'll take you through that in a little bit of detail. In our food division, we want to optimize the customer mix and continue to develop our value-added businesses. That's things like e-fulfillment and also pallet line. But in line with the expansion of crew, if there are major contracts that we can pick up with food um, importers or distributors, uh, we could look to expand the business with a back-to-back -back contract. In feeds, we look to continue our consolidation of the UK ruminant feed market. And critically, as we said earlier, we're promoting personal development with the NWF Academy and looking to recruit another nine into that academy at the end of this financial year. Then move into the fuels market in a little bit more detail. Here, critically, this is a very fragmented market. If you look at the uh, pie chart on the right-hand side, um, starting at 12 o'clock and going to three o'clock are the top 10 players in the market. You see the small red slice is NWF. So we are third in the market 
with a 2% market share. It's actually doubled in the last 10 years, but still relatively small. That large gray area represents about 150 businesses which are smaller than that top 10. So it's a very fragmented market, and therefore there are lots of opportunities to have discussions with potential players and acquire businesses to consolidate further. On the left-hand side, I've shown you BP's energy outlook from 2019, which shows the demand for oil is relatively stable up to 2040. And for NDWF, the most critical market for us is domestic home heating. And there are some 1.4 million homes that are off-grid in the UK and use oil to heat their homes. And right here now, there isn't an alternative in terms of a boiler for those customers to use. So for the foreseeable future, there will be a sustainable demand for oil across our key customer bases. So that says a sustainable market, and that says there's an opportunity for consolidation. Then really show you our track record, and this is over the last two years, we've acquired five businesses and added just under 30% to the size of our network. On the right-hand side, you can see the map of the UK and where those businesses have been acquired. In terms of our operating area, it's Great Britain, so apologies to anyone in the north of Scotland. And just to highlight, Chris and I have been to Inverness in the last 12 months, so we are uh, looking north of the border, but it is Great Britain only in which we're looking to operate. Our model is very clear. We acquire businesses and retain the brand. So the front end of that business, as far as the customer or the consumer um, is concerned, is unchanged. So we maintain the business, then integrate some of the back office operations. And our track record is shown in the chart at the bottom. You can see 10 years or so ago, we're doing just over 300 million liters. Um, and our last 12 months number is now up to 700 million liters. So quite significant growth. I'll now hand back to Chris, who's going to take us through sort of current position of acquisition and how we're moving that forward. Chris. So we've got four clear criteria for, for m and that I'd like to highlight. So the first is that we're, we're very clear on what we're actually trying to buy. So that's fuel distribution businesses in mainland UK. We want businesses that have a good local reputation and brand, and importantly, a strong domestic customer base. And then we'd like to have some potential for margin enhancement or some cost savings, but we take a very prudent approach to value in those. And, and lastly, in terms of our criteria for M&A, it's really important that we can buy that business for a sensible price. So we're looking to buy things at six times the EBIT that NWF will be able to make from that business. Once we've agreed a deal, we have a standard M&A process that's led by the PLC team. And we use the same legal, financial and environmental due diligence providers who know what we want, what risks we're specifically interested in, and therefore have a very tailored approach to us. We do our commercial and operational due diligence in-house, but again, we have a standard uh, flow of work that we use to do that. And we also have standard legal documents to make the processes as, as seamless as possible. Once we've bought the business, we then have a detailed integration process. And as Richard says, what we're looking to do is leave the front end of the business, the bit the customer sees, intact while we fully integrate finance, IT, credit control, and operational aspects so that we have full control, but the front end looks the same to the customer. We're keeping the bit that's valuable. And whilst we've had a pause on M&A activity, we have spent more time just refining that integration process. And lastly, the key point is the pipeline of opportunities. So COVID hasn't impacted on the long-term dynamics that drive the consolidation opportunity here. And that is that we have a, a, a large number of small businesses that are owned by people who are close to retirement age and keen to realize a capital gain. In the short term, it's a little bit stickier to get transactions done because it's harder to have face-to-face -face interaction, but we're very confident that as things start to ease up, then the pace of that can accelerate. And even while we are in lockdown, we have live discussions taking place. So we, we are confident deals can be done even in a lockdown environment. Okay, thanks, Chris. So what I've put up here is our ESG framework. It's on our website and it was also detailed in our annual report in the summer. And in our ESG framework, we have four key pillars. The first one is creating a culture of safety. And in the first half, there's been a real focus on machinery guarding in feeds. And we've launched an initiative with cross-functional teams in our agriculture business to look at safety as a holistic thing because there are issues about um, operating on farm. 
In terms of investing in people, this has been a big item for us in the last six months and 12 months, clearly with people working at home and people working socially distanced at work. We've actually invested in recruiting HR business partners for each of our businesses. We've put in regular employee surveys to really understand the pulse of our organization. And it is fair to say our teams are struggling uh, currently with the lockdown uh, from continued home working, but we're doing all we can to maintain the motivation and communication with all of our teams. We look to build strong partnerships, particularly uh, with our key food customers. We've got good contract renewals, which have happened there. And as you know, we work as a key advisor uh, with dairy farmers across the UK. In terms of respecting the environment, we continue to focus on optimizing consolidation. That's a key for uh, minimum uh, waste as we drive up and down the motorways. Fuel efficiency is critical. So we continue to reduce the average age of our fleet. We now replace all vehicles at five years old. So that means we have a young fleet, which is fuel efficient and also reduced emissions. And we're doing further work in our fuel business on things like biofuels. We're working with Shell in exclusive arrangements in the UK, looking at potential use of biofuel to replace some diesel or even replace some heating oil. So we continue to operate across a number of areas. Final couple of slides now. This is first of all the NWF proposition. So it's a very clear pattern that we have. So first of all, we have a strong management team. So that's lots of seasoned professionals with lots of experience in detail of the markets in which we operate, but complemented by new hires who bring different skills and capabilities into the organization and will challenge the norm. We've got a very clear growth strategy, and that's something we're pleased to be delivering on and continue to deliver on as we go forward in 2021. Uh, we have a large amount of asset backing. Chris talked about 194 million of gross assets. So that helps us to sleep at nights, but also gives us a very cost effective source of funding. We focus on return on capital and we generate cash. You know, if we're not investing in development expenditure, we generate net two to three million pounds per annum. What we're then focused on is delivering total shareholder return. And good evidence of that is the increase in the dividend by around 5% in 11 of the last 12 years. So very much a progressive dividend delivering shareholder value. So now the final slide, really highlights the strong platform for further growth that we've established. We've got a very solid result in the first half of 2021, delivering on our expectations, and critically, really demonstrating the resilience we have in spite of all of the challenges. We're currently trading in line with the board's expectations. We have the seasonal increase in demand, particularly for fuels and feeds that we'd expect moving into the key winter period. In fuels, there's opportunities for further market consolidation, and Chris is on with acquisitions. We're working hard on that. But there's also the potential for increase in heating oil demand as we continue to be locked down and working from home. In food, demand stability needs to be um, improved to help us improve efficiency. And we've seen a little bit of that in the last few weeks. And in feeds, demands are stable. But what we've got are increasingly volatile commodity prices. So commodity prices have continued to increase since period end. And so finally, I'm pleased to report we've got confidence in the future development opportunities and the outlook for the group. So that really concludes the presentation. I'm happy to open it up to Q&A. And we've got a question from Charles Hall from Peel Hunt. Good morning, Richard. Good morning, Chris. Hi, Charles. Hi um, could you just comment a bit about uh, the opportunities in fuels and uh, acquisition potential? Um, both in terms of, of talking about uh, the pipeline, the speed of acquisition, maybe the propensity of owners to sell um, post-COVID, and just comment as to whether your any of your thoughts on acquisition prices and returns have changed compared to pre the pandemic, i.e. You know, is it more attractive now and there's a bigger land grab and you might be prepared to pay more? That's Chris, several that? questions, Charles. Yeah, but a lot. I'll have to go that first, Richard, and, and you can chip in. So if I if I deal with the last one first, I don't think it's changed the valuation parameters. Um, clearly, as we have um, domestic focused fuel businesses, will have had a, a positive trading um, experience through COVID. But uh, we saw with the beast from the east that doesn't tend to change people's long term view on the value of their businesses. So I think our valuation parameters remain the same. In terms of the scale of the pipeline, I think similarly that's the same as it was before COVID. 
So those down, dynamics I talked about with the, the age of the people who tend to own these businesses is the same. And there may be an element of once they've got through you know, this, this period, actually they think actually now is the time to retire. So there might be a little more actually of a push to, to sell once we've got through this phase of the pandemic. Obviously, milk prices have risen, which offsets the increase in costs of, um, of feed for dairy farmers. Um, but can you just comment as to whether you're seeing any change in market dynamics? Because um, that can be a potential um, change in supplier if there's an opportunity to play one supplier off another when you get sharp increases in prices, or are you seeing farmers being loyal during this period? Um, it, it's, it's a fascinating market environment because it's something we haven't seen to this extent before, this, this amount of volatility. Um, so what it means is farmers are getting a reasonable price uh, for their milk about 30 pence per litre. And that has absorbed the cost increases in feeds that we've delivered so far. There are further cost increases or prices that are going up over the next few months and that, that could cause a bit of pressure. Um, however, the dynamic is we're not seeing any real movement of farmers from one supplier to another. Uh, and that's because actually if you have new business, you'd need to charge it at the full price of the replacement commodity. And therefore, new business prices would actually be higher than existing business. It's an unusual situation. So we may have customers who've got a fixed price for a period of time. That price might have been fixed in September. So they might be currently enjoying a price at something like 40 or 50 pounds per tonne below the current replacement market price. So no compounder is aggressively going out there for new business because it would be a requirement that therefore buy expensive raw materials to manufacture that product and deliver. So fairly stable in terms of customers. Um, the key will really see what happens going into the summer as people come off fixed price contracts uh, and what happens with commodity prices at that time and also the milk price. Um, we'll go to Peter Ashworth from Shawcap. Morning to you both. Um, following on Charles's question, he rather um, answered the, asked the question I was going to do, but being a bright man, he's ahead of me in the pack. Do you think CGT changes and the idea that when you sell your business, you may in the very near future face a different tax uh, background that may stimulate some of the people who are in the independent sector to sell? Is that a, is that a, is that could that help the the, the pipeline with uh, without it, it, could help and hinder actually peter so um there are conversations we are having at the moment that are being fueled by the fear that um the cgt rate will will increase significantly um which is helpful um and and i'm old enough to remember this happening last time round in in sort of early 2008 um the, the flip side is actually if if the CGT rate is lifted to a very high level, then the differential between realizing a capital gain or just continuing to hold the business and um, earn income starts to be chipped away. So um, the ideal would be there's the threat of it happening from our perspective, but then it doesn't actually happen. And that's the end of questions. Richard, do you have any closing remarks? Uh, nothing significant, really, just to say um, it's a solid start to the year, robust first half. Um, the key winter months are, are where we're working through at the moment, and we're navigating through those fine. Um, so we're comfortable that analysts have us down to maintain uh, full year expectations. Um, and it's one where resilience has really been the key. Um, and we're thinking of all the challenges that we've had in the last six months. So certainly over the next 12 months, we'd hope there are less challenges for us as a, a management team and a board. Um, and we continue to focus on the growth and development.